In this lesson, we are continuing our study and looking at the biblical foundations for mission. And we've been considering God's mission already in the Old Testament. Uh, for this session, we will consider how that Old Testament mission finds its fulfillment in the New Testament, particularly in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So let me go ahead and pull this up here. And as we consider mission, I want to do a brief uh, overview of what we covered already in the Old Testament. If you remember, we talked about this idea that uh, the whole Bible, this unfolding drama, this great story, the, the one true story, uh, the narrative of Scripture is a story of God's mission. There, there are other themes in the Bible uh, that aren't only focused on God's mission, and we can certainly trace those as we go through the canon of Scripture, uh, but for this class, we're seeing how this story of mission really ties together the movement of what God is doing in the world. And so we, we can consider this in several ways. Uh, four acts, or for our purposes, we're considering these six acts. And if you recount uh, in creation, we saw that uh, man and woman were first created as image bearers. They were to reflect God's glory. They were to live under his rule and reign, and display that to the world. As they did that, God's kingdom was going to be established through his vice regents, through his image bearers who were to exercise dominion over the face of the earth. Of course, they rebelled against God, and therefore they were exiled from the dwelling place of God, uh, from that garden temple, the place where man had access to the very uh, presence of God, to walk with God in the cool of the evening, to see the face of God, as it were, in the garden. And this rebellion happened because of man's rejection of God's commandment. Rather than submitting to the king of kings and the ruler of all things, uh, mankind took upon themselves the ambition to forge their own path. And in doing so, their sin separated them from the living God. But not only that, because of humanity's role over creation, all of creation was subjected to bondage. In fact, the earth was cursed and uh, work became difficult. Childbearing became difficult. Uh, Romans tells us that, Romans 8 tells us that the, the whole creation groans under this bondage to the consequences of sin because of humanity's sin. And so God has been on this mission to redeem humanity. And we considered in detail last week how God called Abraham. Uh, he, he focused on one nation out of all the nations. And he was going to use this nation to be a light to the Gentiles. Uh, Israel, of course, was uh, brought into slavery, but eventually redeemed and experienced God's deliverance through the Exodus. And as God brought his people into the promised land, they were to live there as a kingdom of priests, as a holy nation, representing the creator living under his commandments given through the law in the Old Testament. And in doing so, they were to be a display people, right? To, to show the surrounding nations, uh, all of whom were pagan idol worshipers, all of whom worshiped and served creation rather than the creator, Israel was to be a light uh, so that people could come from the surrounding nations to the place where the temple was, to the place where uh, a people lived as God's kingdom people, and see what does it look like to live as redeemed humanity? What does it look like to live as God intended us to live as his image bearers? And we saw 
all throughout the history of Israel that over and over, just like Adam had failed, so too Israel failed. Uh, Israel was like a a son of God. They, they were called the son of God at one point, and just like Adam was, and uh, and yet as, as God's image bearers, as his sons, as a kingdom of priests, and uh, as those who were to represent him, they failed again and again in their sin. Israel, rather than being a light for the nations, actually adopted all of the surrounding nations practices from the kings to the priest and became idolatrous even in the very temple of God and so God brought judgment once again the Israelites were exiled out of their land into Babylon and though there was a return of sorts by the time we get to the New Testament uh, the nation of Israel is really in this season of waiting waiting for God to reconstitute Israel and fulfill all the promises he made through the prophets, through the covenants to Abraham, to David, uh, and through the new covenant that would come. <clears throat> and so this is where we find ourselves in the, in the storyline of scripture as we come to the New Testament. And I wonder if you've ever asked the question or thought about why the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, start with these long genealogies. Why does Matthew and, and the Gospel of Luke include these long history and genealogies? And of course, one of the answers is what we've been talking about. That's because God is showing how he's accomplishing and fulfilling all of his purposes and promises made throughout the Old Testament. So we're going to consider today the final three acts. And now we're considering Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, uh, Jesus, the anointed one. Of course, both Messiah and Christ uh, are synonyms for this term of God's anointed and promised one. <clears throat> and when we come to Matthew, the New Testament, we see these genealogies. And notice how Matthew sets up his gospel. In verse 1, Matthew chapter 1, he says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew is at pains here, uh, and if we had time, we could read through the list of uh, the 28 generations that Matthew lists in chapter 1. He is, he is making a case here that this Jesus is coming in fulfillment of God's promises made to David, as we saw last time, uh, this promise that he would have an offspring, a seed. And of course, to Abraham, that a seed would come through Abraham to bring about God's salvation blessings, not only to the nation of Israel, but to all the families of the earth. And as we continue through the New Testament, we find this promise has indeed been fulfilled. Galatians 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, that is plural, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. So the Apostle Paul here in Galatians is confirming what Matthew is pointing to, that, that Jesus is the promised Messiah fulfilling the promises given all throughout the Old Testament. God's mission to redeem humanity, to establish his kingdom through his anointed king is coming in the person of Jesus. And not only do we see in the New Testament that the promises made to David and Abraham are fulfilled, but rather the the authors of the New Testament, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, go even further to tell us 
that Jesus is doing something uh, that goes all the way back to the, the beginning, that goes all the way back to the start of the Bible, where we saw that Adam was to be a representative, a vice regent under God's rule, and to uh, bring about a humanity that would submit to him, that would glorify and worship him in his presence. But of course, he failed to do that. Well, Jesus comes also not only as the son of David and Abraham, but also, Luke tells us, as the son of Adam, indeed the son of God. Uh, the New Testament is at pains to help us understand that Jesus is coming as the exact image of God because he is the second person of the Trinity. He is God himself. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, as Colossians 1.15 tells us. What that means is that Jesus is coming as really the, the last Adam, the second man, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, that he's coming to start a new race of humanity that will indeed uh, function as God's image bearers and will live under God's rule and reign in God's kingdom. So Jesus comes to fulfill the promises even made to Adam and Eve. Back in Genesis 3.15, if you remember, God promised the woman after sin entered the world that he would send an offspring, a seed of the woman, who would crush the head of the serpent. That is, Jesus, the offspring of the woman, would overcome uh, the powers of darkness, would, would conquer the kingdom opposed to God, and would establish God's kingdom once and for all. So this is who the Messiah is. Uh, the authors of the New Testament are at pains to show us the continuity from Genesis all the way into the New Testament or the New Covenant. And yet we need to think more carefully about how does the Messiah uh, bring about God's kingdom? How does the Messiah fulfill all of God's purposes? You see, by the time Jesus came on the scene, uh, all of the Jews were living back in Jerusalem, and yet they were in captivity in many ways still. Uh, the Roman Empire occupied their land. So if you were a Jew in the first century and you wanted to go worship God in the temple, uh, you, you could do that, but there were many restrictions. Uh, there would have been Roman <clears throat> soldiers living or stationed in the temple that are controlling every activity you do. You, you're having to pay taxes to Rome. Uh, all the promises in the Old Testament that we saw about a king coming from David who would establish a kingdom forever or about a offspring from Abraham coming who's going to bless all the families of the earth and establish his kingdom. Well, that's not what the Jewish people are experiencing at all at that point. And so they're waiting for the Messiah. They're, they're anticipating when he will come. And yet, based on all the promises and their reading of the Old Testament, uh, they viewed the coming of the Messiah in this way. They viewed it as a change from the old age. Uh, the king would come, and all of these eschatological, these end-time promises that God had made to Israel, right, that they'll have a king that rules over all the other nations, that all the nations will come streaming into Jerusalem and worship the one true God. Uh, they believe once that Messiah came, this would all happen immediately. He would come with great political power. He would come in might. He would conquer the Roman occupiers and deliver his people, just like he had done from Egypt back in the Exodus. Uh, the Jewish mindset was this. And so when Jesus comes as a king, 
And yet, in a way that's very different than what the Jewish people had been hoping for, it, it's no wonder that they didn't receive him as their king. Uh, in your reading, you saw that Jesus' ministry was primarily going to uh, the nation of Israel first. Uh, over and over, Jesus makes that clear. I, I've come here primarily to um, minister to the Israelites and to offer myself as a king. And yet, as he did that, we come to find that the nation as a whole rejects him. And part of that is because, as I already mentioned, they didn't understand the nature of Jesus's kingdom. They did not realize that the kingdom of God as inaugurated, as established through Jesus, was primarily a spiritual kingdom. That is, it was a kingdom that would bring about a deliverance, not just from earthly enemies, but rather from the much greater enemies of sin, Satan, and death. In fact, all of those uh, types or pictures in the Old Testament of God's acting and delivering were, were just pointing ahead to a much greater deliverance that would come through, kings, through King Jesus. But we do see Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. When he comes, do you remember what he said? The, the first announcement he makes is, repent, for the kingdom of God is here, or it's near, it's at hand. Uh, the kingdom of God has come because here is the king of that kingdom. Uh, Jesus was in, in uh, Luke chapter 3, he's baptized. He, he, this, and in that bapti baptism, after that baptism, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And then immediately in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is uh, on a mission to overcome and push back the kingdom of darkness. Uh, do you remember he goes into the wilderness and he, he contends with Satan? Uh, he, he engages in this temptation, much like the first Adam, but whereas the first Adam fail, Jesus is victorious. And then all throughout Jesus's ministry, he's, he's pushing back the kingdom of darkness, and he's showing that where his kingdom comes, the, the curse is reversed. Uh, that's why we see healings brought about by Jesus, along with the casting out of demons and the deliverance of those suffering. So, Jesus comes as the last Adam, doing what the first one failed to do, conquering the kingdom of darkness, establishing his kingdom, and he's going to establish a new people of God, a new Israel of sorts. So this is why he calls out 12 disciples, much like the nation of Israel was established with 12 tribes. Jesus calls out 12 men who will be the foundation of this new people of God. Yes, it will be a continuation of the old people of God, the old covenant people of God, and yet it will take on new, uh, a new shape, a new dimension. So all throughout Jesus' ministry, he is pushing back the powers of darkness. He's revealing that he is a king, <clears throat> but his kingdom is unlike the kingdoms of this world. And we see that in the Gospels. As, as all of the Gospels come to a climax, uh, they, they focus the majority of, uh, or a, a large majority of their books on the last week of his life, on his Passion Week. And so, as you even saw in your reading, one author has said the gospels are really uh, passion narratives with long introductions. That, that is, they really all are, are climaxing and pointing toward this moment when Jesus will go to the cross, die for the sins of the world, be buried, and be resurrected. <clears throat> Indeed, all of the Bible is, 
is moving in that direction to this time where the servant king will lay down his life. And, and so while the Jews thought Jesus would conquer with military might and political power, uh, the astonishing reality is, is that when he went to that cross and laid down his life as a sacrifice for sins, uh, he, he did it in order to overcome the kingdom of darkness, in, or, in order to bring about forgiveness of sins, and to bring about ultimately the restoration of humanity and all of creation. So just prior to his death on that cross, uh, you may remember that Jesus spends some time in the temple. He turns over the tables, he cleanses it, and he indicates that that temple, that place where God's presence historically had dwelled among Israel, is going to be destroyed. He's going to establish rather a new temple, a temple that's not located only in Jerusalem, but in fact is made up of living stones that fills all the earth. <clears throat> Jesus, before he's crucified, he celebrates the Passover meal. And in doing that, he institutes uh, the Lord's Supper. He, he tells the disciples, in effect, that what you saw in the Old Testament with the Passover lamb being sacrificed and the, the blood of the lamb granting deliverance from God's enemies and judgment, uh, that was just pointing forward toward me. And now through my shed blood as the Passover lamb, I'm going to, going to establish the new covenant. And in addition, Jesus brings about a new exodus. Uh, a deliverance, as I, we already talked about, so much greater than deliverance from political enemies or earthly powers. A deliverance from our greatest enemy, that is sin and death and Satan. And so Jesus is victorious, but he's victorious through his sacrificial death. As we go back and look at the Old Testament scriptures, this doesn't surprise us because uh, places like Isaiah 52 and 53 pointed toward this idea that the Messiah would be a suffering servant, that he would overcome by his substitutionary atonement and death. You see, all the earlier covenants were leading up to this fulfillment. And through Jesus' death on the cross, now the new covenant has been inaugurated. Uh, now Jesus can offer the forgiveness of sins to all who will come to him in faith and repentance. Jesus is, uh, you know, has been crucified. He was buried. And yet he rose victorious on the third day. And he ascended into heaven. And in ascending into heaven and sitting down at the right hand of the Father, uh, we are told that Jesus continues to rule over his kingdom on earth as a king. So the Davidic king, the suffering servant, the offspring of Abraham, the snake crusher, all of those promises are fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah who reigns over his kingdom right now from the right hand of the Father in heaven. And a, and a part of this coming kingdom, one of the main promises in the new covenant was that God would pour out his spirit in the hearts of his people. We saw that in Jeremiah 31, that no longer will the law be external, but God will write it on our hearts. He will come to dwell inside of us as we are part of his living temple. And we will know God personally. We'll be reconciled and restored into fellowship with him through faith in him. So all of God's mission comes to a climax in King Jesus. And it comes through his crucified uh, work for us at the cross and his following resurrection.
In doing this, God has overcome the kingdom of darkness and has established his kingdom. Uh, in the next lesson, we'll talk about how then this moment is, is the moment that there's a great turning, a great reversal in God's mission in the world. A, a reversal in the sense that it used to be for the nation of Israel, people would come to them. We talked about that centripetal aspect, that all the surrounding nations could come and see. But now as Jesus is resurrected and he's conquered sin and death, he's going to commission his disciples and us as the church. And he's going to say, go and tell, go and spread this good news to all the nations. We'll consider that in our following lesson.